there is one thing I've learned in Atlanta is to say, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> OK, it works. You're going to have to be with my French accent once more. I'm sorry for that. I'm going to start with a quote from a French politician. His name is Jean Jaurès, a politician from uh, France again. If we want the ideal, you must first begin by understanding the real. So before we get into the theme of today and tomorrow, navigating the new world order, I felt it was a good idea to share with you a certain perspective on where the world is today. Uh, I've been one of the co-founders of a think tank based in Geneva who's been working on this for years. And most of the work I'm going to present you this morning is coming from uh, this uh, think tank. You may know a French writer, I'm sorry, uh, then I'm done with France, but <laughs> called Jules Verne. Jules Verne wrote a number of novels back in the 18th century. One was From the Earth to the Moon, which inspired a number of young kids, inspired also Walt Disney, who did an attraction based on that. But he also wrote a book called Around the World in 80 Days. So I wanted to take you around the world, and I first started working on a, on a presentation, which was Around the World in 80 Minutes. But John Hope and Kevin Boucher, who, by the way, has done an amazing job with his team to put together this forum this year, told me it was way too long. So I shortened it <laughs> into around the world in 18 minutes. That's what, we're going to, uh, that's what we're going to try to do. But before we get there, I would like to give you a few comments about where a number of people think the world is today, because we tend to think that the world is worse today than it used to be, when in fact, the world has never been better. There is a book in the bookstore, uh, which, uh, you know, there are quite a few uh, very good books, by the way, uh, but it's from uh, Mr. Uh, Steven Pinker. Uh, I may want to quote him, maybe the most significant and least appreciated development in the history of our species is happening now. In fact, the world has never been better. When I say that, everybody looks surprised. But if you look at the world today, there are less wars than there have been in centuries. Even terrorism is at its lowest in centuries. Babies' mortality is the lowest it has ever been. Life expectation is the highest it has ever been. And even poverty is the lowest it has ever been. Doesn't mean that it's at a level which is acceptable. And it doesn't mean that we don't have challenges. But I just wanted to make this statement that we tend to think that the world is in terrible shape when, in fact, it's not. Now, back to our journey. The world in 2050, around the world in 18 minutes. I will start with, so the, the 18 minutes are going to be six observations, seven certainties, and five uncertainties. So I will start with my six observations. First observation, a new world and a new intellect. We are not at the beginning of a new millennium. We are at the threshold of a new civilization. The Gutenberg millennium, which is the one which just ended, was the kingdom of the left side of the brain. One of logic and reason. Our new civilization, our new millennium, the kingdom is the right side of the brain. Paradox, freedom, and intuition. This is a drastic change. The consumer society is moving into an information society. The mass society is moving toward a society of individuals. And the standardized society we had up to recently is moving toward a hybrid society. That's the first big observation. The second one, 
a world of total transparency. We live in a post-Snowden, post-WikiLeaks world. We would like to believe that is not the case, but the notions of privacy and confidentiality have disappeared or are in the process of disappearing. Third observation, a world in midstream. The world today is a world of friction between two huge forces. On one side, a remarkable central tension. On one side, huge innovation and technological advancement. We have never had so much innovation. And on the other hand, a rapid social change and transformation. And the two in a certain level of friction. Four observations, a world in constant acceleration, compressing time. We live in a high velocity world. The result primarily, primarily of widespread technological innovation. There is a general sense that everything is going faster and faster and sometimes we try to catch things but they move faster than we can catch them. Five, ob fifth observations an interdependent world. We talked briefly about it three years ago, uh, so I'm not going to elaborate much, uh, but today you have economic risk, geopolitical risk, societal and environmental. These are like four big bubbles. In each of those bubbles, you have sub-bubbles, and all those sub-bubbles are connected to each other in each big bubble and outside in each other big bubble. And the result is a world difficult to understand. Try, <laughs> try it. Um, this means that the complexity, interconnectivity, and speed we have engendered in the global landscape transcend our ability to comprehend, model, or manage events. Many limitations constrain our ability to interpret complex issues, particularly as we tend to attribute single causes to interconnected events. And this is literally overwhelming the capabilities of individuals, like all of us, but also politicians, business leaders, and so on, to make well-informed decisions. So these are, we dealt with the observations. Now, seven certainties. First certainty, which we addressed again three years ago, um, a world more global and a world of, glo of growing inequality. Global growth worldwide is the highest it's been in time. It may not be the highest in every country, but if you take a combination of emerging countries with developed ones combined, growth is still very significant. Globalization has taken two billion people out of poverty, even if today you still have three million billion people below poverty level, including 45 million in the US, and in the US including 9 million people with no income whatsoever. So that's the global world, and also growing inequality, and inequality is not growing country by country, it's growing globally, which is a major issue. Second certainty, traditional economies are challenged. The two main pillars of the world economy, the Western world democracies. Robust economic growth with rising living standards in the United States, a credit consumption-led economy on one hand, and the welfare state and income redistribution in Europe, both of them are challenged. As well, by the way, as the Chinese economy, which is an economy built on export-led growth supported by an undervalued currency. So the new challenge is a new world, a Western world with less growth and deflationary forces at a time where productivity is declining. Productivity has been declining for the last 25 years. A recent Gallup study published in partnership with the US Council of Competitiveness showed that this 
lower productivity has been the case again for 25 or 30 years, and the main reasons are healthcare, housing, and education. The combination of declining productivity, too much debt, and too little growth is leading us into a classic debt trap. I would like to show you this. So since we started, look at how much the debt phase is increasing. Anyway, I don't look at it too much because it's a little scary. So third certainty, the planetary boundaries are being challenged with uncertain consequences. All of the security alliances were built, made after World War I and World War II. And most of them are obsolete in the two days world. Bretton Woods, obviously, it's gone. The WTO, World Trade Organization, NATO, but also the United Nations were all conceived at a time where the world was working in a very different way. A number of politicians have tried to address the issue and recreate new forums or organizations able to deal with the issues of the world today. That's how the G7 was created. That's how also the G20 then was created, but it doesn't solve the issue either. In fact, we have inherited from the time where we lived from the land or the industry a mentality now outdated. Unlike Earth, which is divisible and controllable, science and technology are not. And those are going across border, making traditional borders like very blurred. And that's the issue with those organizations have to deal with today. Four, the convergence of emerging nations and development ones. A few facts. 19 of the 30 first world economies in 2050 are going to be emerging economies, more than half of the countries. Two, the emerging economies will collectively be bigger than the developed economies by 2050. And the last one, which I find important, is that more than half of the GDP growth over the next 10 years, I'm not talking 30 years, over the next 10 years, will come from emerging countries. I would like to show you three pictures I've taken myself. This is Shenzhen when I visited in 1980. These are pictures taken, the one on the right from my hotel room. And here's Shenzhen picture taken today. I know <laughs> that's what's happening in the you know, emerging world. Uh, we could take pictures like this in, a, in India, in a, Indonesia, uh, and so on and so forth. It's the, same, it's the same thing. So what about the Western world? What about the dominant Western world? A friend of mine, Chandran Nain, uh, who created the Institute of the Future in uh, Hong Kong. I'm going to uh, quote him. He expressed doubts that the dominant Western ideas in the past 100 years are much of a guide for the future. Many of the economic development ideas the West believe to be long-held truths and major Western contributions to modernity no longer seem so accurate. And we in the Western world have to cope with this reality that there is in other words, outside of our world. Five, fifth certainty, demography. First, the world population is aging. That's obvious. But also, we will have two more billion people on the planet by 2050. The world population is going to grow from 7.5 billion at the end of 2017 to 9.7 billion by 2050. All of this growth will happen in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, not in the Western world. The world population, uh, Western, the Western world, represent today 25% of the world population, will represent 12% of the world population by 2050. And uh, 
obviously, uh, this will have consequences, particularly on immigration. When we talk about immigration today, the problem is nothing with the compared to the problem we'll face in the next 20 to 30 years. And last, cities are growing into mega cities. Just one figure, 1.5 million people every week move from wherever into cities. Six, global warming. I'm not going to elaborate more. I know it's a controversial subject here, at least in the US. <laughs> so I'm not going to argue, but scientists and economists kind of agree that this is a major threat which will create damaged property, will also increase immigration forced by, you know, floods, drought, and so on and so forth. So that's an issue we need to be aware of. Seven, technology, I addressed it two years ago when I talked about the digital world, so I'm not going to elaborate further, except that obviously technology is turning the world upside down, and that unfortunately, a lot of leaders today are living in a world which doesn't exist anymore. Now, let me go into uncertainties, five uncertainties. First one, very fundamental. The transatlantic partnership we've seen in the last 100 years, we, we talked about it briefly in my first comments, is challenged. America's interest in Asia are growing. Let's say the relationship, economic relationship with Asia is becoming much bigger than the one with uh, Europe. That's a fact. And it's not a question as to whether politicians or people don't have a good relationship. It is just that strategically, now and in the next few years, Europe and the United States will part on a number of strategic issues. Natural evolution is obviously the Pacific, but a lot of things are happening in the Pacific. One, I will not comment on the current political situation in China, but I will comment on one initiative the Chinese government has taken uh, about a year ago, which is this investment in the new Silk Road. It's called the Belt and Road Initiative, where China is going to invest trillions and trillions of dollars to create roads, railways, ports, airports, and so on, all over Asia, all the way to the gates of Europe, Turkey, and gate to Africa in Pakistan. The program is underway, and it's uh, an amazing program. A number of Asian countries wanted to counterweight the weight of China and created what's called the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, together with Mexico, United States, and Canada. But the United States decided to pull out of the TPP, so those countries have now no choice but to be under Chinese domination. So when I say uncertainties, the uncertainty is who will dominate the world by 2050. The world was run from the Mediterranean Sea up to the middle of the 18th century. Then you had the emergence of England and its colonies and the world trade. Then you had the United States, its creation, independence. Then this transatlantic partnership between Europe and the United States now moving to the Pacific. So who will be dominant? Is it the Pacific? Is it China? Or is it the US? Question. Second uncertainty, the role of innovation. I'm calling it techno-optimist versus techno-pessimist. That's a subject we're going to address uh, today and uh, tomorrow. Two schools. First school, robots are going to steal all of our jobs. If you look at what experts are saying, every job, every single job could be fully automated in the next 100 years. So obviously, all the jobs will be gone. But then there is another school which thinks that if governments, employers, and educators would, should be urged to equip people with the skills they need to work alongside robots. There is a very interesting initiative taken by AT&T, uh, and by the way, the CEO of AT&T Communication is going to be here to tell us about it tomorrow on how to deal with this issue. 
the fundamental design pattern of success with technology is to enable people to do things today that were previously impossible. Companies that only use technology and robots just to cut jobs and do less are going to be surpassed by, those, surpassed by those who use it to help them do better and more. That's the challenge, and that's the two schools. I'm a strong believer, by the way, of the second school. Third uncertainty, the origin of the next crisis. So I, in my introductory remarks, I said that the world is in better shape today than it has ever been. However, it doesn't mean that the world is without crisis. There will be crisis. Now, where is the next crisis coming from? We don't know. Political? Is it going to be a debt crisis? We saw the figures. A bond crisis? Excess liquidity issue? A lot of bankers in the room know about this. Is it going to be a war between Sunnites and Shiites? Is it going to be a problem with North Korea? Is it with China? Nobody knows. The fact is, we're going to have crisis. Four, the future of democracies. And this is a subject in itself, so I'm not going to elaborate much today, but I'm working on a whole presentation on this because I think that our democracies are not threatened, but are being challenged. Global malaise, crisis of legitimacy, rise of populist movements across the board. Tony Blair, the ex-Prime Minister of England, of the United Kingdom, uh, calls it the efficacy challenge. And Danny Roderick, I'm quoting him, says, today democratic governments perform poorly and their future remains very much in doubt. The core, you know, we talked about growing inequality. We talked last year about disconnection from constituencies and so on. The core of the crisis of representative democracy is due to a widening gap between people's aspiration and expectations and the capacity of political institutions to respond, to respond, I'm sorry, to the demands of society. One politician, ex-president of Brazil, Cardozo, frames it extremely well. It is one of the ironies of our age that this deficit of trust in political institutions coexists with the rise of citizens capable of making the choices that shape their lives and influence the future of their societies. Big challenge. And this is just starting when we look at the tools that tech companies are created, creating. That's a subject, obviously, uh, today. And the fact that they are getting out of control and participating to this democratic crisis. Fifth uncertainty, and that's going to be the last one, the role of wellness. The skyrocketing cost of chronic disease. I'm going to mention the figure, $47 trillion by 2030, which is 30% of the world GDP is not sustainable. So wellness should not become, should not be optional as this today. Wellness should become mandatory. There is a positive correlation in addition between happiness and entrepreneurship. I'm not going to elaborate on this, but uh, Gallup is doing very interesting surveys. It's called uh, with uh, Healthways, and it's called the Gallup Healthway Wellbeing Index at the world level. It's very interesting. So you can look at this. Are you happy? Yes, no. Uh, a good beginning. So with all of this said, are you ready? No. When you look at the world, it's complex and challenging. Are you ready? I think we can be ready through collaboration. Almost always, great new ideas do not emerge from one single person or one single organization. They emerged from the intersection of functions of people or organizations who very often have not even met before. These are the great ideas. But organizations are siloed. 
Politicians are siloed. Social leaders are siloed. Entrepreneurs are the same. Business leaders are the same. All together, they are siloed. We can notice that each time academics, politicians, economic and social leaders, entrepreneurs connect, get together and collaborate, they fuel change and deal with issues. Collaboration is essential. And there is no collaboration without connection. And collaboration and connection should be the underlying theme of discussion or philosophy of today and tomorrow. Now, the brief video has conclusion. When I think about connection, I think about intersubjectivity. I think about the human capacity to pierce beyond the veil of individuation and to enter the holy other, to blast new tunnels between the mind and the other. We resist, we refuse to live alone inside of our own minds. Instead, we crave an intersubjective ecstasy. We crave a crossing over. We create cinema that allows us to experience a dialectic shift to enter the subjectivity, the interiority of another person. That's why cinema is an engine of empathy, because it allows you to enter that something else, that someone else, that somewhere else, to pierce the veil that separates us from one another, to enter a kind of technologically mediated Buddhism, to create an internet that links together billions of minds transcending time, space, and distance, collapsing geography, all becomes one. What is within becomes without. This is kind of wonderful, right? When I think about connections, I think about understanding, which as Carl Sagan says, is a kind of ecstasy. So that with comprehension comes meaning, comes signification. That's what I think about when I think about connection. So next, ne today and tomorrow, collaboration, connection. Thank you.